Hey guys, Thing Fishy here. So make your character, choose the prisoner starting class, and grab a golden seed as the starting gift. So while we run to Torrent, let's talk about this guide. Welcome to build guide number 10. And this build started out as a dex int build. However, much to my surprise, the weapon I chose to use ended up being so powerful that instead of the quite balanced, versatile dex int build I'd intended, I ended up chasing the big damage and making a late game bullying monster. This run included more first tries and perfect no hit fights than any of my other guides, and is a solid contender for the most broken build I've made in the game. It's also one of my favourites because of how versatile it can be, so this is definitely one that you'll have a lot of fun with. So let's talk setup. As usual, I followed my standard setup route. Link to the full video and play along in the description. But unlike some of my other guides, you really don't need to do that much of it. The only thing that I bother with is grabbing the golden seeds, sacred tears, and the somber stones that you see along the way. As we're not going to level up our weapon until both Rikard and Radan are dead so you don't need to bother with early Volcano Manor either. So we pick up the action here, at the first step in Limgrave. Head into Argyll Lake and into the Dragonburnt Ruins. Open the chest in the basement to be transported to the Celia Crystal Tunnel. Run out of the cave, rest at the Grace, head outside and ride southwest to the streets of Sage's Ruin. First run into this ruin on your right, and down to the basement to grab Rock Sling. Then head southwest to grab the Meteor Staff from the body on this building. Now walk to Lena's Rise in Kaelid and make it night. Jump onto the side of the bridge and make the cavalry jump off. Now I've noticed that some of you are having trouble with this in the comments of previous guides, so let me mention a couple of things. First off, no. As of patch 107, this hasn't been patched. What can happen, however, is the cavalry can jump off the bridge, like you see here, and miss all of the kill boxes and land safely at the bottom. At which point, because he's out of range of his normal area, he will respawn on the bridge. This tends to happen more when he falls off the east side, but it can happen with either. So if this happens to you on 107, don't panic, it hasn't been patched. Just repeat and you'll be fine. Now warp to Fort Farath. Equip the Morning Star and apply Bleed Grease to it. Kill Grail and pop a Pickled Foulfoot as she dies. Then level up at the Grace. Now we're going to head to the Gate Town Grace in Leonia and ride east to the Carian Study Hall. Run in and all the way to the second level to grab the Carian Glintstone Staff. We're not actually going to use this staff, but it provides a buff to one of our spells. Now walk to the Grace near EG in Northern Leonia. Drop down the ledge and head north along the cliff to the Intelligence Knot tier. Knit back to EG and equip it at the Grace. Then head southeast across the lake to the Bellum Highway. From here, head up past the Madness area, and drop down by the Minor Erd Tree, and spam Rock Sling at the Erd Tree Avatar. He'll go down pretty easily as long as you keep him at a distance. He will one-shot you if he gets close enough, so be careful. Now we're going to head back to Limgrave to the Argyll Lake South Grace and southeast to this camp. Run up onto this ruin and grab the Royal House Scroll. From here, drop down and head north to the Waypoint Ruins. Beat up the Pumpkin Head with either Rock Sling or just use the Morning Star. He's probably the easiest boss in the game, so you'll be fine. Speak to Selen, hand over the Royal House Scroll and buy Karin Slicer. Now I killed Loretta first in this playthrough because it makes a specific questline a little easier. At the Grace, equip the Intelligence and the Magic Shrouding Tears, 
memorize Karian Slicer, and equip the meteorite staff in whatever hand you want to cast with. I quite like casting from the left hand when I can because it allows me a claw cool grip with my right, but casting from the main hand is fine too. Then put the glint stone staff in your other hand to boost Karian Slicer. Karian Slicer is still as busted as ever, so Loretta shouldn't be a problem. After the fight, head towards Rani's Rise, but stop off at these ruins just before and head down to check out Selavus's creepy puppet dungeon. Then light the grace in Rani's Rise, and head back to Limgrave for Margit. Equip the Rift Shield at the Grace. We can't repost with the Slicer, so I'd highly recommend putting it in your right hand, as main hand parries are just cool. For the most satisfying Margit fight, one parry, three slicers, another parry, three slicers. And I've been a bit rubbish at mentioning this recently, but I suggest parrying a lot in my guides, and for every boss I've done an in-depth guide on how to parry them. So you can check out those videos if you're not comfortable in parrying a specific boss. Now run through Stormvale Castle, dodging all of the projectiles and enemies perfectly. And now for Godric. Karian Slicer is a dream for this fight as you can use those long wind-ups to spam it and do massive damage. Get stuck in for phase 1, and for phase 2, run up and spam it through the scripted attack. Then you only need about one dodge for the win. Now walk back to Weeping Peninsula to the Castle Morn Rampart Grace. Up the Spirit Spring and east for some Starlight Shards. Then back to Argyll Lake South in Limgrave, up the Spirit Spring and east again for more. Then head to the Altus Plateau and ride northeast from the Grand Lift. Grab the Grace at the Highway Junction, then head northeast again to find this ledge. Drop down and grab the Amber Starlight by the statue, then walk back to Rani's Rise. Speak to Rani and the boys, then go see Celebus in his rise. Take the potion from him, then head back to the round table and give it to Gideon. Then back to Celebus and ask him about his chambers. At this point, buy Let Me Solo Her, then pop Godric's Rune and buy his first three spells. Quit out to reset him, he'll then offer you another puppet and finally tell you about his scheme and give you the magic scorpion charm. Equip this in your first talisman slot and go speak to Roger at the round table. Now to rare Lucaria for Red Wolf. You can spam Roxling from a distance or use Slicer, but he's going down really easily. Head up the ladder to the upper part of the debate parlor to grab the Radagon's Icon Talisman to make Slicer a little bit faster. Then head to the third church of Marika and ride south to the lift and down into Sifra River. Ride through to the section with the archers and head northeast to this broken pillar. Then use the teleporter at the top. Ride around the cliff keeping well away from the Dragonkin soldier and grab Marika's scar seal to equip in your second slot. Now for Renala. Now as we know, she has insane magic resistances so Slicer is completely useless against her. Roxling, however, works pretty well. It does really good damage, so if you want a few extra levels you can kill her with this method and stick the runes you get for it into your int. I, however, find getting into a casting battle with Renala utterly rage-inducing, so I'm going to come back later in the playthrough when I can completely flatten her. Head back to Rani's Rise and ride east. Drop down into this building and buy the Karian Retaliation Ash of War to attach to your shield. Now to Volcano Manor. Run through the dungeon and grab the Somber Six on the roof of this building. Then up the lift. And along this cliff for the Somber Five. For Godskin, Parry strats for the win. First off, you can use Karian Retaliation to parry the projectiles for some extra damage. For the bulk of the fight, one parry and two slicers will do the trick.
make sure you have two stone sword keys and run through the dungeon and through the stone sword key gate all the way down to grab the somber seven by the abductor then back through again to Rykard's grace as always equip the strength tier to your physic and radagon's sword seal the lance in one hand and serpent hunter in the other do crouching pokes for both phases to stun him out of those dangerous phase 2 attacks. Nip back to the round table and grab the third talisman pouch from Enya. Now head to Kaelid and to Redmain Castle for Radan. Now if you're thinking it's a bit early for him, don't worry, we have the strongest weapon in the game. As you can see here, even with the bad RNG where he rides around a lot, Karian Slicer's insane DPS is enough to kill him in both phases very safely. Now head down into the crater, through Nokron and towards the site of grace by the ancestral woods. Head down into the knight's sacred ground for the finger slayer blade. Then back to Rani and grab the statue. Now at this point you'll be able to use the teleporter in Rena's Rise to reach Ainsel River. Now first off, we're gonna kill Spider Astor. These things look intimidating, but the main reason that you shouldn't be frightened of them is that they have the lowest poise of any enemy in the game. A single rock sling will stun. Then it's just game over. Run through the ant caves to the grace at the start of Noxtella. From here, double back on yourself and head up this ladder and through more caves to another spider astal hanging over the lower part of Ainsel. Kill it so it doesn't get in your way, then head to this chest for our main weapon for this run, the Wing of Astal. Walk back to the Grace by EG and level it up to plus nine. Now the Wing of Astal is such a cool and interesting weapon. The R1s are super fast, the R2s fire magic projectiles that can be buffed in all of the usual magic boosting ways, and the Ash of War Nebula shares its animation with Flame of the Red Mains. So if that's anything to go by, it won't do a whole lot of damage, but it will be awesome for posture damage. So our setup now will be using Nebula to stagger enemies, and then using the massive DPS that we get from Slicer and the Wing of Astal's R1s for big damage. Before we try it out though, head to the round table. Now I hope that some noble questline nerds in the comments might help me out here. All through this playthrough I'd been popping back to speak to Roger at various points. And after doing it here and quitting out to reset the area, I found him dead and could finally grab his set. I assume the trigger for this is either killing Radan or entering Ainsel River, but I couldn't find a definitive answer to this anywhere, so it may be possible to get this set earlier. But if you know the definitive answer to this, please let me know in the comments. Now head to the Altus Plateau for the Draconic Tree Sentinel. So let's try out this Ash of War and see what the staggers are like. If you were listening very carefully there, you might just have heard the sound of my balanced, versatile dex int build idea dying. We'll save that for another guide, because after seeing this fight, I just had to know what this thing is capable of if we max it out with buffs. Head back to Radan's area and speak to our best bud. Then ride across Altus, around Volcano Manor, and past the Seath Water Terminus to speak to him again at Mount Gelmir. Now head into Lindell and all the way to the Avenue Balcony Grace. Then go back and beat up the tree avatar. <laughs> now 
Now Nebula destroyed the Tree Sentinel, but he's relatively easy to stagger. So how will it do against the boss who's far tougher to stagger? Okay, so I'm pretty sure that Morgoth is about to have a very, very bad day. Put these foolish ambitions to rest. Put these foolish ambitions to rest. So for smaller enemies, the key to getting the best out of this weapon and this Ash of War is trying to make sure that the enemy is right in the middle of the nebula explosion. This can be a little bit RNG based depending on the enemy, but generally you want to stand a few steps away from them as you cast. Five full contact hits will kill Morgoth, but you might need to do a couple more if he keeps scooting out of the AoE. Now head to the mountaintops and over the bridge. When you come off the bridge, kill this Scarab for a Somba 8. Then head all the way up to the bridge directly above the Snow Valley Ruins Grace for a Somba 9. Now for Fire Giant, and I'm just going to let this one play out. Speak to Melina and burn the Erd Tree. As usual, run all the way through for Armazula, all the way to the Transept Grace. Before heading back to Kale at the Church of Allah for two crack pots and the crafting kit, back to the secluded cell in Stormvale Castle for two crack pots by the pot friends, and back to the Ball Prawn Shack and south into the village of the Albanurix for any extra mushrooms you need, the first half of the secret medallion and some St. Trina's lilies. Head back to Farron, craft your sleep pots and head in to put the wet bandits to sleep for a super simple fight. The posture damage from Nebula will keep them both stun locked, so this couldn't be any easier. Head back to the round table and buy two stone sword keys. Then through the dungeon and up the stairs, through the stone sword key gate and over to Alexander. Fight him and take the shard that he hands you before he wanders off back to Jarburg. Equip this in your fourth slot. Run past the dragon to grab the ancient somber stone, then head up to the beside the bridge grace. Now for another tree sentinel, so time for more bullying. Okay, make sure you dodge that first slam. Now back to Ainsel River and through the Lake of Rot to Astor. Now, the secret to this fight is positioning. Nebula's arc is an almost perfect fit for Astor's jawline. So if you get your positioning right, I reckon you could kill it in three hits. Now, if you're using more spells than I am in this run, jump back to the Church of the Plague in Kaelid and ride into Celia Town. Light the three towers and head into the boss arena to bully the Nox duo. Then grab the best staff in the game. All you need to level it to plus nine is a somber six. The fastest one to get is from the Grand Cloister Grace. Out into the Lake of Rot and hug the right wall to find this scarab. You can now head back to EG and plus nine it if you want to use spells for the rest of the run. While you're here, level up Wing of Astor to plus ten. Now for what is probably the hardest fight in this whole playthrough. 
the big problem here is that clergyman only has one attack that's long enough for us to safely get a nebula cast in that dragging swing so to be as safe and efficient as possible you can just wait for that one attack and only cast then you can also cast in front of him and hope that he lunges into it but you will waste some fp doing this Malekith, in comparison, is relatively simple. Despite the high stagger damage, you might not get a stagger here unless you had a really good clergyman fight. But if you wait for that slow 1-2 combo and punish it with one or two casts of Nebula, you'll be fine. Now, for the Ashen Capital. Head up to the worst boss of all time, drink your physic, and pop an Exalted Flesh to ensure that we won't have to fight him. Four casts will do it. Level up at the Grace, and so that we don't waste 50k runes, go get another 3k from somewhere. Law nerds in the comments, I once again ask for your assistance. If Margit is an extension of Morgoth that reaches out beyond the capital to kill Wandering Tarnished before they can approach, and Stormvale Margit despawns when Morgoth is killed, why is this one still chopping about? I assume the answer involves larval tears, but it's always bothered me. Now for Godfrey. Now as always, the safest approach for this fight is to use quick attacks between these combos. But as I showed earlier, Nebula works great too. Whatever your approach, try to use a couple of Nebulas to finish off Phase 1. Doing this means that you can stagger Horolu at the start of Phase 2. Then you'll only have to dodge a couple of attacks for the win. And if you saw the little teaser that I posted for this guide, you know what happens next. Run into Radagon's arena and cast Nebula while his Windows Vista AI boots up. Two casts is enough to trigger the jump attack. One more in the recovery for a stagger. Take the riposte and cast one more time as he stands. This will trigger the triple slam, dodge it, and one more on his back for the win. Run up to Elden Beast and cast from this position. As sketchy as it looks, standing here is completely safe. When he staggers, move your camera around and hit the weak spot with three more. Drink your physic while getting in position, and just at the last minute before he goes to swim away, take the riposte. Two more as he recovers. I managed to get this perfect fight first try, but I'm sure there was probably a little luck involved. So getting those inputs perfect might take a couple of tries if you want this ultimate Elden Beast fight. Now to Castle Soul. For Commander Nile with Nebula, you can run in and cast right in front of him to deal damage to him and if your positioning is perfect, you can actually one-shot both summons at the same time. If you want to be safe, aim slightly to the right so you definitely get the dual wield guy. For a very safe rest of the fight, keep your distance and bait that mini tornado or electric foot attack. For both of these, you can dodge the attack and then stand just outside of his reach and cast Nebula. Grab the other half of the secret medallion and head down into the snowfield and all the way to Ordener Town. From here, head southwest to the Mogwin Palace teleporter. Jump on this ledge to cheese the invader, then ride through the area all the way up to Moog. And I know what you might be thinking what about the purifying tier for Nihil? 
Well, watch this. Yep. You don't need to worry about Nihil if he's going to be dead before he can do it. A key tip here is to take that repost at the last minute when you can. Like Elden Beast, another nebula here would do more damage than the repost, but it would also allow him time to start Nihil. Whereas a repost will do decent damage and allow for one or two casts as the enemy stands back up. Now back to Farum for Plassey, and since we're doing some perfect fights in this run, here's the perfect start to a Plassey fight. Run from his front to his back, casting Nebula in between the lightnings. After four, he'll stagger. When he does, get a Nebula on his head, and then a last minute repost to allow time for one more Nebula cast. For the rest of the fight, just cast one or two nebulas between all of his claw attacks. Now it's time to backtrack to the Karian study hall and up to the top for the curse mark of death. Then back to the Ancestral Woods and into the Aqueduct for the Gargs. You'll be happy to know that we can two-shot both of them. Now to deep root depths for Fierce Champs. This can be a bit of a headache, as they love jumping out of Nebula's path. So feel free to use the Wing of Astol's R1s or Karin Slicer to make this a little easier. For Fortis Axe, as always, try and get a headshot in at the beginning. Then we do enough damage to kill him in another two casts of Nebula. Okay, only two bosses remaining, so back to Ordinar Town. Once again, I'm using Ordinar Skip here as it still works on 107, but see the faith guide for the light roll strategy if this gets patched in the future. Jump on the pillar, line up your compass to the right of this notch and do two jumps with the direction order being 12 o'clock, 7 o'clock. Now we run through the Halic tree all the way to Loretta. Now, as always, she's not going to make it easy for us. But use her casts and those big blue combos as an opportunity to cast Nebula. It's fine to tank some Karian retaliations in order to do this. Just make sure you're at full health before you do. Run through Elphiel, down to the Halig Tree Roots Grace. Pop all of the remaining runes you have on you and level up for the final fight. Now, as usual, the Goddess of Rot isn't going down easily. And while Nebula has generally been fine with smaller bosses, Melania is just too quick for spamming it at her to be a safe option. What is safe, however, is to hit her with it while she's finishing an animation. And you'll never guess how I decided to do that. Parry her three times, take the repost, take a couple of steps back, and then cast Nebula. One cast is always safe, but you can get away with two sometimes if you're feeling brave. You can also safely cast it when she lands from her jump or stab attacks. Just don't do it while she's idling, she'll dodge it immediately. Now I did come across something interesting in this fight. This was the first time that I'd used the Karian Retaliation Asher War since I started my channel with my Shield Comparison Parry Guides and my How to Parry Melania Guide. Now, ever since I made those guides, I've known on paper that Karian Retaliation is a better parrying tool than the Buckler, with a slightly quicker start-up. 
but this never really translated into something that I could actually feel. Kari in Retaliation and the Buckler always felt identical to me, even on Melania's quick 1-2 attack. However, after a few months of using the Buckler for Melania exclusively, I noticed that in the 5 or 6 attempts this fight took, that I hardly missed a single parry, apart from the couple that I knew I fluffed. Now this could have just been a good day for my reflexes, but I'm going to use Kari in Retaliation on the next few guides to see if there is a consistent improvement with it. And that's it, how to make a completely broken build with the wing of Astel and Nebula. If you've enjoyed this video, give it a like, leave a comment with a build that you'd like to see me cover, and subscribe to my channel for more Elden Ring build guides. As always, thanks for watching. See you soon.